somebody who I consider almost like kind of my mirror in this, this chiropractic world. Uh, a few years ago, I went out to Life West for the wave. And on my way out there, uh, somebody by the name of Dr. Mary Flannery, uh, who many of you know, uh, called me up and said, listen, when you're out here, you need to meet this Dan Bronstein guy. And so what do you, who is he? What's the deal? He goes, I don't know if I've ever met somebody as passionate and righteous about chiropractic as you until I met Dan. My bearded brother, Dan Bronstein is an amazing perinatal chiropractor with a passion for using uh, tonal approaches to adjusting subluxation. He's going to uh, inspire you to take action. I'm so excited to hear him. Dr. Bran uh, Dan Bronstein. <laughs> Hey everybody, Dr. Daniel Bronstein. Um, wow, I have to follow Spolstra. Wow, yikes. So when Justin first approached me to, uh, to do this, um, I put three goals in my mind. The first goal was to rise the tide for all of our ships. The second goal was to not piss anybody off, and the third goal was not to curse, but Steph already broke that seal, so fuck it. Um, <laughs> the goal of today, this last presentation, is to talk about care planning. And, um, you know, it's a controversial way to, you know, kind of close down the day because everybody has their thoughts about care planning. Um, but as a straight chiropractor uh, who slays subluxations all day long, um, you know, specializes in complicated cases, you know, my goal really is to help you guys understand the power of chiropractic so that you can care plan appropriately. Um, Stevenson said, Chiropractic is only urging the natural, but so unnatural as civilization made people that natural is greeted as something strange and radical. This is 1927. What has changed in 100 years? Not a thing. Not a thing. So we owe it to ourselves to go backwards before we can go forwards. Let's talk a little bit about salutogenesis. So Antonovsky uh, coined this term back in 1979, um, and he said, life experiences help shape one's sense of coherence, or SOC, Life is understood as more or less comprehensible, meaningful, and manageable. Um, Antonovsky was the first scholar to really talk about health on a continuum. It wasn't just health and disease. It was from the very you know, bottom, death, all the way to striving with life. And this is back in 1979. The sense of coherence that he talks about reflects a coping capacity of people to deal with everyday life stressors. So as coping capacity improves, so does health. And what does chiropractic do more than help our patients cope with stress? He also coined the term generalized resistance resources, um, which basically says, well, what resources do we have to give to our people to help them improve their adaptability to stress? The degree to which a person's SOC and their health has evolved can predict happiness and contentment. This has profound implications for our messaging as chiropractors because it frames better health as a means to enlightenment. Think about that for a second. It is therefore incumbent on us to be steadfast and relentless in our outreach to both new and existing patients because Antonovsky would say that we are literally saving lives. If we can improve our patients' ability to adapt to stress, we improve their happiness, which means we improve their ability to manifest their destinies. So let's talk about a few pet peeves, and this is the part where I may piss people off, so sorry about that. First and foremost, let's stop using the word treatment right now because we do not treat conditions. We do not treat conditions, we correct subluxations. Amy just talked about it perfectly. So let's stop using that word. Second, let's stop giving away care. I teach a lot of seminars, and I meet a lot of chiropractors, and one of my biggest pet peeves is talking to chiropractors who give away their pediatric care for free. This is terrible. In order for a patient to have a sense of coherence, they need to establish an equal exchange. So make sure that you have a fee that people can afford. Third and four, uh, uh, last. Let's do chiropractic right first. Another thing that happens when I teach seminars is we get a lot of conversations, mostly from students, but from some younger docs too, about cases that they're seeing. Let's say, for example, a patient comes in and they're constipated. I've tried chiropractic a couple times. It didn't work. What else can I do to help this patient? My response in that case is always the same. What kind of a care plan do you have them on? How are you adjusting them? What's your long view for the, how you're gonna see this patient? And ultimately, 
the response that I get from most of these chiros is, well, I only see them once a month because they can't afford to come into care anymore. Or, you know, they're driving for too long of a distance. Well, in my mind, in a subluxation brace principled practice, that's the problem, you guys. If we cannot adjust and check our patients on a schedule that is commensurate with their level of subluxation, we're not going to get the results that we're looking for. Major stressors in order of severity. Let's talk about these things. First and foremost, mechanical. This is notably birth trauma. Mechanical is the hardest thing to fix in a chiropractic office, but it's also the most common. Second, emotional. Let's talk about COVID for a second. I'm going to talk about this a little later, but how many of you guys are running HRVs on your babies? How many bad HRVs are you guys seeing in your babies now? All of them? Transgenerational stress is a fucker. It'll really wreak havoc on your babies. We gotta make sure that we're measuring that. Number three, chemical. You guys all know this. Food coloring, additives, sugar, gluten, dairy, medications especially. And then number four, all credit to Monica Berger who brought this up for the first time to me. Technological, blue light, radiation, EMFs, 5G, all that junk can uh, short circuit neurology. And we wanna make sure we're on top of it. So let's talk about subluxation. Subluxation is insidious. It's unrelenting and has tangible consequences to our patient's well-being. It has demonstrable effects on the afferent feedback to the cerebellum, feed forward activation of the prefrontal cortex, the central integrative state of the brain, and all of its motor sequelae. Children are under more stress than they've ever been in modern history, especially with COVID, guys. This is a huge process. So we've got to take chiropractic seriously in that regard. Birth is becoming more difficult. I'm going to share a story with you guys. Four years ago, I was in Paris doing grand rounds with chiropractic students at EFAC, and our keynote speaker was a guy by the name of Michel Odon. How many of you guys know Odon? If you guys don't know it, he wrote a book called Primal Health. It's mandatory reading for anybody who takes care of pregnant women. Michel, he was 88 when we saw him. He sat on a train for four hours to get there to talk to us for four hours for free about birth. The guy had been at OB for like 60 years to that point. And he said something that will never, ever leave me. He basically said that we have genetically selected away from vaginal birth. Think about that for a second genetically selected away from vaginal birth because we spent three, four, five generations intervening in the birthing process. Intervening in the birthing process. Our moms have a harder time in our generation delivering than their moms and their moms before them. So just take that into consideration when you measure birth trauma. Our kids' abilities to adapt as compromises is demonstrated by the litany of poor HRVs and thermography scans that we've collected in our uh, clinic. As Drew talked about, neurodevelopmental disorders are on the rise. One in six kids has a developmental disorder. More and more children are presenting to our clinic specifically with complaints of anxiety, panic, and suicidality. The last new patient that I saw on Thursday was with a 10-year-old who's self-harming. We see a lot of these cases and it's getting worse, so we gotta take it seriously. This represents the ultimate failure in adaptability. If they do not have a sense of coherence, they need the ability to adapt. So how does chiropractic fit in? Chiropractic care improves adaptability and removes interference from the inside out, as you guys know. A cumulative survival value was talked about by Stevenson back in the early 1920s. This is basically what BJ talked about as creating a healthcare savings account, right? We want to put more into our account than take away. Gravity is the one universal force that never shuts off. So the way that we adapt to gravity is directly proportional to how our nervous systems adapt to stress. If you cannot resist gravity correctly, your brain does not work correctly, which means if you're subluxated, you're not resisting gravity correctly and your brain's not gonna work correctly. So focus on the subluxation, make sure you have a technique system and analysis and an ability to know when a patient does not need to be adjusted. In my clinic, 25% of my patients come into the clinic and do not need an adjustment. That's the goal of a chiropractic visit in my office because what does that mean? They have a clear functioning nervous system. Remember. A chiropractic adjustment is a potentially destructive force. Innate is constructive, so just keep that in mind. Allow the body to heal itself by adapting better to distress in its environment. Let's talk about requirements for plasticity. We want to promote long-term stability in these patients. Two things are necessary for neuroplasticity, glucose and activation, and of that activation, there are three sub-requirements. The first is specificity. I can't remember who talked about this previously. Somebody talked about specificity. This means we have to identify the irritation points correct them and leave everything else alone because if we do too much, we overwhelm the nervous system and the body doesn't know how to adapt. 
Number two, intensity. For all intents and purposes, this means how big of an adjustment do we give our patients? We need to know how much sensory input to put into the neuraxis to make that plastic change without completely blowing them out. And you guys know what I'm talking about. If you've ever seen a blowout, you'll know what it is. It's like the worst meltdown you've ever seen. That's exceeding their metabolic capacity. And number three, most importantly, repetition. We need reps in order to make plastic change to the nervous system. Think about it like you're learning how to play the piano. You never learned to play the piano before, you suck at it. But when you practice every single day over and over and over again, it becomes innate and you don't have to think about it anymore. Holding an adjustment is very much like that. The first adjustment that your patients get in your office are likely only going to hold for about four to six hours because it's a skill they've never done before, especially if they've had trauma from birth. We want to get them to the point where they can hold for a week or two weeks or a month or however long we can get them to hold because it gives the nervous system breathing room to make the changes that we're looking for. In my office, I model my care on certain historical models. BJ, and this is an apocryphal story, perhaps it's not true, but I heard a story. BJ in his clinic when he was doing inpatient work and he would adjust and check patients six, eight times a day, whenever a patient needed to be adjusted, BJ would pay the patient five bucks because he wasn't doing his job. But when the patient came in and didn't need to be adjusted, the patient would owe BJ 500. You see the point? We're trying to create self-sufficiency so that the patients can do their own jobs on their own. Spears obviously had an inpatient facility as well where he was checking people on multiple, uh, multiple times per day. And Bobby Dosher, you know, you guys know what she's doing at Oaklehaven. I heard her speak at a kid's summit about five years ago, and she said something that really racked my brain. She was talking about a case that I'm pretty sure was a transverse myelitis case that she saw at Oaklehaven. She's talking about the miraculous results that she got. And in the back of the room, one of the folks there raised her hand and said, Bobby, what was the diagnosis? And Bobby said, who cares? They got better. <laughs> Sounds like typical Bobby Dosher, right? That's the point of what we're trying to make, right? Who cares what the diagnosis is? Follow your objectives and make sure the bodies are doing their jobs. We cannot expect to care for our patients the way our forebears did a generation ago and expect to get the same results that BJ got in his clinics. Care plans need to be longer, more intense than ever. Patients need to be prepped early and often for lifetime care after their corrective care ends. Our adjusting styles need to adapt to the central integrative states of our patients' nervous systems, and we must modify our care on the fly if we observe the care is too intense or not intense enough to encourage the summation we're looking for. We need to know whether or not our patients' nervous systems are hyper-aroused, hypo-aroused, or unstable, and we have scans at our disposal to be able to tell. If we look at all these things in context, we are on the verge of a chiropractic renaissance. When I come up with care plans, I learned this years ago, um, I come up with a number that makes me really uncomfortable and then I multiply that by another 25%. You can over adjust a patient, but you can never over check a patient. Let me say that again. You can over adjust a patient, but you can never over check. It is vitally important that when a patient is on a care plan, we are working towards self-sufficiency over time. So let's talk about a couple of these cases. This is Rooney. We just published a case on her back in uh, January in Matt's journal. She has a defect called a cask defect. It's a very rare genetic disorder that looks like cerebral palsy and autism combined. Um, it's characterized by cerebellar hypoplasia. If you look at her scan on the left side, and we could not get an EMG or an HRV on her because she's too wiggly, and we had to get a segmental thermal, but look at what we're seeing on that thermal over to the left side. This, this kid, his brain is on fire. This is a perfect example of a hemisphericity in my clinic. One side is lighting up like a Christmas tree. This is bad news. I was seeing her twice a day when I first got started because it was so difficult to keep her stable, I didn't know what was gonna happen between visits. So I checked her in the morning and I checked her in the afternoon. And it took me roughly a month before she could start holding an adjustment overnight. We get this next scan a month later, looking better, not perfect. So I started to scale her back. I started seeing her daily, then three times a week. Finally. At that third scan, we're starting to see things start to shift and things look a lot better. At this point, we started to see symptomatology change for her. This is a kid who couldn't walk correctly. She had no vocabulary, no eye contact. No, her digestion was crap. Her sleep was crap. And mom started to describe improvements in all of these things, things that our doctor said are genetically not possible to change. Fast forward to that fourth month and her thermal is perfect. This is when we started to see huge changes with her. But the point was, if we didn't stay the course on this case, we never would have gotten there. Second, Sage. Oops, sorry. Let me take a step back. Nope. Sorry, what did I do? Can you send me back to that Sage slide? There we go. 
okay? Sage is a CP kid. She's also a seizure kid. Her thermal and HRV were inconsequential. They were both fairly normal, but her EMG was a mess. Thanks. Look at that first EMG. That is a perfect example of dyspinesis, which is abnormal energy output, right? For those of you guys that are measuring EMG, you've seen this before. If I'm recalling correctly, her total energy index was in the 400s, which is not great. The first adjustment that I gave her, I blew her out, which means I exceeded her capacity because she had a seizure on the table, okay? In normal circumstances, that would be a bad thing, right? Especially super scary for mom because she's trying to come to us to prevent seizures in her kids. So we backed off a little bit. I started adjusting her a little bit more gently. That was the last seizure she ever had. Look at the changes that we've gotten in this EMG over time. Total energy index is coming down into the 200s until her overall pattern and symmetry scores are in the 80s, which is nice and stable. This kid is thriving now, but it took us a good four months to get her stable before she could get there. This is another case that I'm gonna be publishing light. This kid came into the clinic with a cough that everybody thought was COVID. He coughed all the time. Parents had to test him for COVID every single week because they thought for sure he had it. He couldn't go out in public. But what was happening, what we figured out when we dug a little deeper is this cough wasn't a cough at all, it was a tick. It was a motor tick that was manifesting as a cough. He also got sick every single month and got a fever. After two months of working with this kid nonstop, he never coughed again and he never had a fever again. But look at the changes that we're getting in his scans. His first scan, his HRV is in the absolute toilet. His EMG is all over the place. His thermal's fine, but those are not good because his overall core score is in the 70s, which is not great for those of you guys who do these scans. Fast forward a month later, this is me adjusting him every day for about two to three weeks and then backing off a little bit. His score's in the 83rd percentile. EMG, not perfect, but better. We get to his third scan. His HRV is a little bit funky because I was driving him a little bit harder in the type of chiropractic care I was giving him. But over time, as we started to balance him out, everything looked totally perfect. And I just ran his fifth scan last week before I came here. Scores an 88. This kid is thriving now, and we're transitioning more into wellness care. But like I said, with him, we had to start daily in order to get him stable to the point where he could start doing this on his own. BJ said, if you're not willing to let them die on the table, don't expect to raise the dead. This is a significant, a significant quote from a guy that we should all venerate. What this means to me is that if we do not put in the work and the effort with the sickest generation we have ever seen, we're not going to get the miraculous results that BJ got in the old days. So just keep that in mind when you guys care plan. Thank you guys so much for having me here. I love you all. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I am so turned on right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. I need to cool off. All right. <laughs> we have a wonderful panel that's going to be starting at 5 o'clock, followed by the one and only Dr. Justin Ohm. In the meantime, take the next 25 minutes, go outside, stretch your legs, get some snacks, which we have out there. And uh, we'll see you back here at 5 o'clock sharp. <laughs>